I definitely don't have an MBA. <laughs> I don't know everything there is to be known, but enough where I can be dangerous. It's more about knowing the questions to ask than having the answers, really, I find in the business setting. Few designers have an instinct for business fundamentals. Those that do are able to position design as a competitive advantage for a business and pave the way for design teams to collaborate more effectively. Kate Aronowitz is one of those rare birds. Kate has held high-level design roles at LinkedIn, Wealthfront, Facebook, eBay, and today she's at GV, formerly known as Google Ventures, where she helps early-stage companies find their footing. We speak to Kate about the arc of her career, about entrepreneurship as a designer and why there aren't more designer founders, as well as some of the stories from the early days of Facebook, like how she was one of the first designers to teach Mark Zuckerberg, or as my eight-year-old son calls him, Zerk Merkerbergen, about human-centered design. This is Design Better, where we explore creativity at the intersection of design and technology. I'm Eli Woolery. And I'm Aaron Walter. Get ad-free episodes a week early and get access to our monthly AMAs with big names in design and technology by becoming a DB Plus subscriber. It's also the best way to support the show. Visit designbetter.plus to learn more. We'll return to the conversation after this quick break. And now, back to the show. Kate Aronowitz, so great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Kate, we've been wanting to chat with you for quite a while. You've got an interesting career path, and maybe that's the right place to start. You've led teams at kind of smaller scale and then larger scale, and these days you're at Google Ventures. So could you give us the nickel tour through your entry into design and your career? Like maybe starting with when you were a kid, were you into design? Yes, very much so. It started, I don't know if you remember, there was a toy called Fashion Plates in the 70s and 80s. I was very into fashion design. I would sit in front of the TV in the afternoon and just draw whatever I saw. It was a lot of little House on the Prairie dresses and Madonna dresses from videos, much to my parents' chagrin. (laughs) Fashion was really what I was interested in. My parents always took me to lots of art museums, lots of art books, things like that. And it remained an interest of mine. Then through high school, did some fine art, had never really considered I could have a career in design. It was not something that was pushed on me or encouraged. Started college at Syracuse University with the idea that I could study political science and fashion somehow. And, you know, so the further I got into fashion, I loved it, but I quickly realized it was not something I wanted to do professionally. It was a hobby. I wanted to be inspired, make what I wanted to, and then kind of leave. I didn't want to do a lot of the assignments. Decided I did want to pursue design a little bit more, but wasn't sure what fashion, you know, which field of design I would end up in. And I had never heard of the Savannah College of Art and Design. Happened to be visiting a friend in Atlanta. They said, you've got to go check out this school. I went down. I visited SCAD. I feel like within 15 minutes of being in that city, I knew that's exactly where I was going to land. It's funny. High school, I worked so hard to think about exactly where I was going to go to school. I ended up at a college I'd never heard of. The city was beautiful. The people. It's just an amazing place. And to think that I could go study design in a setting like that was just fantastic. So got to SCAD. The fashion department was like one room in this random building and started to get just concerned that I wasn't going to have much of a career there. And they had computer labs on campus in the graphic design program. And I was like, I'll go check that out. And there was something around the intersection of aesthetics, problem solving, and precision that I loved in graphic design. I love the precision of it. And I love just problem solving. Just it felt right. So ended up at SCAD, finished my degree there. And then I really went on and got a traditional graphic design job. My first one was at a vitamin company. It was supplements. I was doing labels. And then I made my way over to an agency where it was a lot of brand design, 
I even got to design the livery for an airplane and go to air shows in Europe. Again, very traditional graphic design. But there was something that kind of clicked at the agency where I just became much more aware of who I was designing for. I really loved meeting with the clients. I liked sitting at my laptop and designing, but I really loved meeting with the clients. I loved asking business questions, and I really loved figuring out how design could solve business questions. That was a really key awakening for me. It wasn't just about the pixels anymore. It was like, what was the problem I was solving, and who was I solving it for? And then I I moved to California to be with my then boyfriend, but now husband, and tech was the rage. There was no UX degree at the time. I'd never built a website, had no tech experience at all, no web design experience, and got a job at eBay. They happened to be hiring a print designer, I think probably the only one they've ever hired, to do sales collateral for the sales team. And I was like, I need to work. Sure, I'll go do that. And while at eBay, they were just kind of forming this UX discipline. They were putting in place UX research. We had visual design, interaction design, content strategy, which I'd never heard of. And this was back in 2000. So really, my first exposure to a cross-functional UX team. And that just clicked. I found my home. At eBay, again, I really fell in love with understanding the business The key insight I had there were that so many times I'd be on a project and the designers, the product managers, the business folks, they were all talking over each other and everyone would leave the meetings kind of disappointed. It's like they don't get me. The business folks would be like the designers don't understand the business and the design team was like they don't understand me. We're not going to get anywhere. And I found myself going and hanging out more At the time, it was the guys in blue shirts and khakis over in this other building, like, show me your metrics. What are we trying to do? What customers are we trying to hit? And I became kind of the translator and the broker between the design and business teams. And I loved doing that. And that just became the place where I felt like I had superpowers, where sometimes others weren't that interested. That's fascinating. Almost nobody has that. People don't really figure that stuff out easily. Most designers are on the other side, kind of like in the corner doing their creative thing, but not really understanding how to interact with the rest of the business, often not even knowing how the business works. What do you think about who you are as a person kind of gave you that ability to translate those two different worlds? Yeah. And I don't know if it's why I ended up in UX design. I love observing people. If I'm in a meeting, I will be listening to what's going on, but I love looking around the room. Who's getting what we're saying? Who's interested in working together? Who's going to make this successful? Who's going to be the leader? Who's going to make the decisions? And I, you know, UX design, I think a lot about that when you're doing product design, who's the end user. But when I was in meetings, when I was at work, I was just a keen observer of what was going on. And so many times I just felt like we left a room and I thought, had somebody just phrased this a little differently, had somebody just brought a slightly different take on the problem, we could have sped this all up by six months. I'm always very interested in just enabling people to do better work, whether it's getting them better requirements, communicating more thoroughly, or just frankly trying to understand each other more. I was always trying to do stuff outside of the pressure of work to go get a coffee with somebody, ask them, you know, how are they being ranked or rated at their position? How are they being rewarded? You know, how much do they understand about design? What could I explain to them about design? So just an innate curiosity with how people relate to one another and spotting those moments, those aha moments where somebody gets the right information or people unlock an understanding about each other and then like success just like clicks in. I love those moments and I'm constantly looking for them, which is why I think at eBay, I was drawn to managing and running a team. We've all had those moments. Jobs are great, but man, working for the right person, it just unlocks everything. You learn more, your work is better, you're engaged more, and you can, I feel like you make years of progress sometimes just by having the right manager. You know, they expose you to the right things, they give you the right feedback. They see their success as their team's success, not their own. Who was that person for you? This woman named Nancy Dickinson, actually, at eBay. Can you share any stories in particular where it's like you sort of arrived at that insight? 
she set things up for her team to be successful. She was a bit of a stickler about role descriptions. She was a bit of a stickler around requirements. She always wanted to make sure everybody's role was really understood in the room. And she really emphasized that great design, you know, at the time, which is what we were doing, it was truly a team sport. I first got my, you know, intro. I didn't know what a content strategist did. You know, she started the content strategy team where she was instrumental in that. I thought, oh my God, wow, writing is just as important as the visuals. She set up an environment of collaboration. And she also, I think, saw things in me that I didn't see in myself. Kate, you're ready to run a team, or Kate, you're ready to lead a project, or Kate, you're ready to be the one to write the presentation and give it to the executive team. She always was ready to just give me the right amount of opportunity where it stretched me a bit and made me a little nervous, but she also knew that I was going to succeed. I learned a ton from her about business and design, but also just how to like unlock talents and other people and give them the right opportunity at the right time. Kate, I think there's a lot of things to dig into on the leadership front, but I just want to go back for a second to the business side of things. And it sounded like even in your agency days, you were interested in business. Did you have any kind of formal training or was it just like reading books and absorbing things through your environment? How did you go about learning about those topics? Yeah, none whatsoever. No training whatsoever. At one point when I was at, this was the early 2000s where designers were going and getting their MBAs, I was very tempted. I thought, this is the time I can have even more impact. But I had my son at the time. I was like, it was not the right time. I did a combination of things. I still, to this day, I keep a moleskin. And if I hear a term or a word I don't know, I'm constantly writing those things down. I try to be confident and just ask in the moment, hey, guys, can we pause for a moment? I don't actually understand what's being said. Or can you go back to that term? And you know when you do that and you're worried, and then all of a sudden you realize no one else in the room (laughs) understood it either. (laughs) So always keeping track of things that I didn't know and going and either looking them up, you know, online or again, just, you know, I'll ping somebody after a meeting and say, hey, what you were talking about was really interesting. Would you mind if I got a coffee? Maybe you can share a little bit more with me. Our first principle at eBay, are people are basically good. <laughs> but, you, you know, you find like if you show like real curiosity for what somebody's up to and show that you have common interests in being successful together, they'll usually help you. And then I've also had just close friends who I met really through work over the years who are on the business side, who I've been able to call at any time and say, you know, what book should I read? Or I'm going into a board meeting, they're going to look at these numbers, give me the basics, like what's a PL? What's this? Like, how do you read this? How do you put things together? It's been helpful. I definitely don't have an MBA. (laughs) I don't know everything there is to be known, but enough where I can be dangerous. It's more about knowing the questions to ask than having the answers, really, I find in the business setting. Yeah. So being able to ask those kind of questions requires a certain vulnerability. Did that carry into your leadership style? Or was that modeled for you by the types of leaders you mentioned before? I definitely try to model it. I was just off site with my team this week and I'm always trying to model if I'm unsure of something, I don't know something, or if somebody on my team knows it better, man, I push them right to the forward. Strangely enough, the person that gave me the most confidence to do this was I remember starting at Facebook and going into a big meeting with Mark Zuckerberg. And I was meeting with Mark to interview for my role at Facebook. And I said, how human-centric or how user-centric would you say Facebook is? And he said, what does that term mean? I was like, oh, cool. Like, I get to explain this to him. And he just stopped me and asked me something that was so core to my job that he was hiring me to do. He didn't understand the term. And I found that he always did that in meetings, whether it was a meeting with other executives or a small group meeting. He'd say, do you mind if we stop for a moment? I don't actually understand that term. Or how can we phrase that differently? Or what are we talking about? What are we trying to learn again? Facebook, for as intense of an environment as it was, In most settings, it was a pretty safe place to ask questions. And really, Mark modeled that from the top. Yeah, that's fascinating and unexpected. I guess I wouldn't have expected that from an executive, but 
maybe in particular Mark Zuckerberg, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. But great, you know, great leaders are curious, and and he certainly has a learner's mindset. I mean, now if you look at like what he's doing, like MMA fighting, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, too. You got yeah. to start from scratch on that one. One year I was there, he was learning Chinese. I mean, you know, and invited Chinese employees to come in and talk with him, and he didn't really know it very well. So, being in a setting with that learning mindset is key. I'm really curious, you know, someone who was so passionate and focused on design in your youth and kind of exploring your way into it, but you've got this other breadth of interest that you remained open to and connected with. As you started to step up in the ranks because you were curious, because you were asking the right questions, and you care about other people's perspectives, those are all really important traits for a strong leader. In that transition into leadership, was that a comfortable thing for you, or did you feel like you were missing some of the hands-on experience of being an individual contributor as a designer? All of those. You know, one of the things Nancy did for me at eBay, my first management role, I managed two people, so it was small, which was nice, and it was in an area that I knew really, really well. It was much more centered on visual and brand and marketing design, which is where I really started in UX. My first couple of years as a manager, I had to remind myself that my success was very different than just making something. My success was going to be the success of my team. How well did the people on my team do? And then also, while I was responsible for the quality of the work coming out of the team, I couldn't go back to my desk and do it. I always say like design management is like designing with your arms tied behind your back, (laughs) which can be quite challenging. You know, it's like asking the right questions or giving people the right tools. Because, man, I mean, I still get that way. Like, I know I can just do this. Let me run back and make something myself. But also, I was quite motivated to be in management and to build teams. That became my design project, right? It was almost like Tetris. How do you assemble the right people at the right time with the right requirements for success? And pretty soon, I felt like I was enabling people to do better design than I was able to do hands-on. And I grew to appreciate that my role was just as essential. You know, when I talk to people now, when they think about going into management, it's like, It's a completely different role. And please don't add to the bad managers of this world by just doing it to either get more seniority or more power. We all know managers actually don't have more power. (laughs) Your motivation has to be very, very different. you got to be much more excited about helping others succeed. Yeah, we just had a conversation with Vanessa Generelli, who wrote a book about dealing with change at work. And this topic came up. And curious how you sort of help people understand like that shift in role or experiment with it or try it out if they're just curious about it. What is your leadership style around kind of building people's career if they're curious about being a manager? When I have career conversations with people, it's much less what do you want to do? I find most people don't actually have something in mind. I mean, some people do. Certainly, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to run the company. I want to do something. But most designers, it's not that linear. And so I usually walk through an exercise with them. I have all these questions I ask that really tries to figure out where do they naturally go to? You know, people naturally spend time in their areas of strength. What are you gravitated towards? Are you gravitated to the beginning of a project? Is it the end of the project? Is it that quiet make time by yourself? And I find people that are probably best suited to management. There are certain things they're more drawn to. And, you know, the best place to start is to give them an opportunity to maybe run a project, run a kickoff, like help write the brief, run critique for your team, start mentoring other folks on your team. I mean, that's the other thing is there are so many opportunities for leadership that really don't have to do with management formal roles. Whenever I've written career ladders for folks on my team, I've always made sure that as you move up through the ranks, you're not only a better designer or putting out more work, you have to have more impact more broadly. To get to a senior membership on one of my teams, it's like you have to show that you're having positive impact on those around you. You're lifting others around you. You're making their work better. It's not just about your work being better. I do firmly believe that the IC track should go as high as the management track. We need to preserve 
those really killer designers, let's not all put make them into managers. Like they get this wealth of knowledge and craft and skill that we say, yeah, did you drop all of that? But those really senior ICs should also be having a positive impact on the team, whether it's in the hiring process or running critiques or mentoring others. It's also just finding people's natural place of strength and enabling them to do a little bit at a time before they kind of make the leap into, you know, building and running teams of their own. Kate, one thing that struck me about your career is there are areas of your career where you spent a large amount of time, like you put down roots and you were presumably there for a long time because the problems were engaging. The people you were working with were good at collaborating or, you know, the environment was welcoming. And then there are some places where in your career, there's like shorter tenure and you move on. You know, sometimes that happens because you moved on to this new thing and you get poached. You know, somebody else knocks on your door and says, here's a really compelling opportunity over here. And, you know, circumstances, the playing field has changed in unexpected ways. And sometimes it's because the playing field you arrived at was not what was sold. I'm curious, like, how have you thought about those transitions in your career? When do you know, like, okay, I'm in a rough patch, but I'm in a good spot. I'm going to keep going. Or it's time to go move on to the next thing. I am incredibly intentional about my career, like very methodical. (laughs) I, I have been. And I'm always trying to coach other people to do the same Whenever I've taken on a new role, I've really asked myself why I'm doing this because you will inevitably have hard days and you want to be able to go home at night and say, no, I am here because I really love and trust the people I work with, or I am here because I believe in the mission. You know, a job is a job at the end of the day, they're going to be ups and downs. So whenever I'm coaching people to think about roles. I'm like, make a list of like the five things that matter to you most. And it can be anything. I'm like, you don't have to share it. It doesn't have to be what motivates other people. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's, I have a new family. I need something to fit in with my schedule. Sometimes it's, I just want to learn how to code along, you know, someone else, you know, make that list, be ruthless and very honest about it. It could be small. It could be large. I don't want to work on Fridays, whatever it is. I like the lunch at the office. And then when you're interviewing or looking at roles, make sure that at least one or two of those things are a real A+. Honestly, you never want to go anywhere that's like kind of a B across the board. Something in your role should be exceptional where you walk in and you're like, I can't believe I am so lucky to either, yes, work on this problem. I can't believe I'm so lucky to work with this person. Each one of my roles has enabled me to do some of that, some of it longer than others. I do go into most roles with the intention of staying for a while. I really love being part of the history of the place. I love building deep relationships. I also think, you know, when you work long enough somewhere, you see the same problem come around a couple of times <laughs> and that's where you grow. Like just solving a problem once or looking at it once and then moving along, you learn something from it. But having a history with folks, getting to put down roots, getting to help be a part of hiring and growing a company, I really love that. I just took my team off site this week. And uh, I've been in this role where I'm managing a team for three years. And it was so fun to like sit down for dinner the first night and look around and realize, you know, we had some rough patches as a team, but man, now three years in, everyone trusts each other. Everyone helps. It's just, we've hit this awesome spot that if I had left during the rough moments, I wouldn't be at this place now where we are like a high performing team and doing like the work of our careers, which is just a lot of fun. We'll return to the conversation after this quick break. Introducing Wondersuite from Bluehost.com, the tool that makes WordPress wonderful for everyone. Website creation is hard, but now with Bluehost, you can answer a few simple questions about your business and goals, and the Wondersuite tools will automatically lay out your WordPress website or store in minutes. Seriously. 
From there, you can customize your design, pick your brand colors and add blocks, no custom theme or coding required. You'll get content suggestions that you can keep or revise. And with Yoast SEO built in, we automatically help you get found in search engines. From step-by-step -step guidance to suggested plugins to an AI powered help bot, our built-in tools make WordPress wonderful for everyone. Maybe that's why Bluehost has been recommended by WordPress.org since 2005. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, you can join over 2 million Bluehost users. Go to bluehost.com slash wondersuite. That's bluehost.com slash wondersuite. Support for Design Better comes from Uplift Desk, creators of office furniture designed to help you work better, and live healthier. If you sit all day at work, like most of us do, and you've never tried a desk that can transition between sitting and standing, let me tell you, it's a complete game changer. I often struggle with hip pain that's caused by prolonged sitting, and a standing desk has helped me switch up my posture during the workday so I can avoid that pain and just feel better. Standing while I work, it helps me get those creative juices flowing, and it helps me focus and stay productive. I'm way more alert, which is helpful, especially after lunch. Each standing desk from Uplift Desk is built with solid materials. They have so many different beautiful woods to choose from. They're built to last, and you can customize it to match your space. Plus, you get free shipping, free returns, and an industry-leading 15-year warranty that covers the complete desk. Eli and I love their products, and we know that you will too. Just go to upliftdesk.com and use code DESIGNBETTER5 and you'll get 5% off your order. That's upliftdesk.com to get 5% off your entire order with promo code DESIGNBETTER5. Check them out. And now, back to the show. Kate, maybe you could talk a little bit. So you mentioned this new team, but you started at Google Ventures as a design partner and did that for about three years as well. Maybe you can explain the shift in that role, what you started at doing there and what you're doing now. So I'll go back to Facebook for a moment. When I joined Facebook, Mark basically was like, I want you to build the best UX or pro whatever we're calling design organization in the world. And I knew that my job was not the creative director. I was not going to set the direction for Facebook, but man, I was going to build the best team and put the right people in the room at the right time. So I remember one of the first weeks I was at Facebook, I sat down with the team and I said, make a list of like the 50 designers in the world you want to work with. It could be anybody, like make your list. And a lot of those folks did end up being at Facebook and it, it was amazing, but there were a few folks on the list that were working at Google Ventures as design partners. Daniel Burka, Braden Kowitz, you know, Jake Knapp, John Zaretsky, that whole group were over there. And I kept calling them and saying, come on over to Facebook, come to Facebook. And Daniel will remind me, he's like, you even like put me in a room with Mark. We even had Zuck trying to sell them to come over. And they wouldn't leave GV, no matter like, we're like, We'll buy the product you're working on. We'll figure it out. We got to get you over there. And they would not come. So fast forward a little bit. I was at Wealthfront and I got wind that they were writing the Sprint book. And I wrote to Jake and I said, I don't know if you remember me. I tried to hire you at Facebook. I heard you're writing the Sprint book. Can I get my hands on it? And he's like, well, I've got these like printouts. He's like, if you promise not to share it with anybody, I'll give you a copy. I went over to the Google Ventures office. He gave me a printout of the Sprint book and like I devoured it. I was like, this is amazing. Not only are they doing hands-on amazing work at GV, but then they kind of open sourced it. It's like, here's our cookbook. Here's our secret sauce. Like, go ahead and do it. And I love structure. Anybody that works for me knows I love structure. I love a repeatable process. I love iterating. So the Sprint book and the team I just was like, I've got to figure out how to work with this group. So eventually Daniel called me and he said, hey, everyone on our team, none of us have management experience. And we're starting to see startups now that have like design managers and leaders. And we need somebody to come in now to help mentor them. And I literally decided that night. I was like, I have to get this job. And he told me you're up against these other people. I made a list of the people I thought they might be talking to. <laughs> and I made a list, honestly, in my head of like why I'm better than these people for this role. And I just, 
I was relentless. I was like in sell mode. I'm like, you've got to hire me. And so what was funny is that there was another woman, Vanessa Cho, who interviewed for the role at the same time, nice. and they hired us both. So getting into GV, there were a couple special moments about that. One, as much as I love managing and leading, I wasn't going to have to manage a team. I was like, oh, this is great. And my entire job was to do nothing but help these startups, like help new heads of design, help them hire heads of design, coach CEOs and founders on how to use the power of design to further their business. It was everything I was most passionate about. And I could do it all day, every day and see like 30 or 40 companies a year. It was fun because, you know, GV, we're in this larger Google Alphabet ecosystem. I get all the benefits, the perks. I get to chat with all these awesome people at Google, but GV is only about 100 people. So it was a small company inside this larger kind of pond. And then because Vanessa was there with me, it had been so long since I'd had a peer that actually did exactly what I do. It's very lonely to be running a design team on your own. So Vanessa and I were given the same charter and to have a partner in crime like Vanessa, I couldn't imagine a better job. And now she's on my team. We still work very, very closely together. So I did the design partner role closely with Vanessa and Michael Margolis, who's our our UX research partner, who also is the best at what he does, like world-class. The three of us working with 30 or 40 companies a year I saw the opportunity for what we had going on in design, which I thought was really special, to do that in other disciplines across GV. So to build that up in talent, to build that up in comms. They had existing teams, but there wasn't a unified strategy. Like, how do we as a team approach founders? How do we as a team collaborate and help these startups? How do we as a team build closer ties with the investing team? And so three years ago, I took on kind of the whole operating platform team and have kind of building been building that out since. And what's cool about it is that we are still a very small team. You look at other venture firms and some of them have, you know, hundreds of folks or dozens of talent partners. There's only 10 people on my team. I think of us as being this really special boutique inside of venture where it's a small team. We can't do everything, but everybody on the team is just world-class at what they do. Everyone has 20, 25 plus years of experience at doing what they do. And we work really closely with the founders and the CEOs at helping them build the best teams and bring the best products to market. Are people receptive of your guidance, you know, when your team goes in? Because that's one of the challenges is like you take venture capital funding and advice and connections, but it's still, you know, they're running the ship. It's their company and they can take the advice or they could choose like, hey, we're going in a different direction. And I could see that potentially being frustrating if you run into that too frequently. Are people receptive for the help? The way to make that easy is we usually only focus on the gigs where they do want our help. (laughs) I mean, honestly, with 400 plus companies, we could easily, you know, get sucked into lots of different areas. My team really only gets engaged when the CEO or the founder is ready to play with us. So we engage always at the top. We also check in with the investor. Is this a company that's really worth engaging with right now? There are big companies that are getting to be super successful. No matter what we do, they're going to go on. They're going to be awesome. They're the all-stars, right? And then unfortunately, there are other companies that probably are not headed for a great future. We have a fun time kind of finding those that are like just about to accelerate out. And they're like the rising stars of the portfolio and with like matching with the right person on the talent team to get that next C level hire or matching them with Michael to do research on their next product, like we can accelerate their growth and their learning by like a couple years, I think, like in just a couple months. So we're usually working with CEOs that are really excited to have our help. And we usually make sure that we're the best people poised to help them as well. And we work on really high impact problems. In addition to that, we have open office hours every week. So anybody in the portfolio can call in to an hour. Maybe it's a designer that says, hey, I did two designs. I just need a second and set eyes on this. Or CEO that's like, hey, I'm in the final interview stretch of a couple candidates. Can you check in with me on one of the candidates or help sell? So we really have a balance of engagements. And the best ones are where everybody's really receptive and excited to work together. Okay. 
When we were talking earlier, before we started recording, you mentioned that you know, there's not all that many designer founders out there. And years ago, I spent some time in the startup world. I had my own venture back startup. And I kind of noticed the same thing. There weren't a lot of designers out there who were starting companies. I'm curious if you have any insights into why that is or why maybe an argument for or against having more designers, you know, be involved in starting companies. Yeah. I mean, I do have to say, you know, it goes up every year. You know, I was just talking or messaging with Ben and Enrique at a designer fund. And, you know, we've got venture fund money that is really focused on enabling designers to do great things. So I do see it more and more. I think it's a combination of things. You know, some of it is just imposter syndrome. Like I talked about not understanding business as a designer. It can be very intimidating. It's like, I've got an idea, but wow, I've never built a business before. And that can be quite intimidating. I think that's probably the number one thing I would point to. And also, and I'm going to make a broad generalization here, (laughs) designers like being parts of teams and they also like enabling other ideas to come out. They don't always have to be kind of the center of the idea. Like I find, you know, much more likely that you'll find a product manager who wants to start a company because that's why they went to business school. Like they, you know, that's what they went to go do. But there are a lot of engineers who fit that same profile. True. They just want to do their own thing. And yet there are tons of engineering founders. Yeah. I wonder if it's because of the kind of problems they see. Like when I think about Mm. like our enterprise founders, a lot of them are pretty technical. And a lot of it's because they were working on a very specific piece of software or something. And they were like, oh my gosh, this could be done so much better. And then they jump out to do it. You know, same with like our health tech companies, right? We see physicians or folks that are in healthcare that spot an inefficiency and say, oh my gosh, I'm going to jump out and do a company where I think I can do this better. It may be the kinds of problems. It may still be a little bit of that imposter syndrome. I was talking to somebody the other day and it's like design, at least when you're not in, you know, when you're in a design agency, that's your product. Everybody understands design, but design is one of those few roles that at least once a week, you kind of have to explain why you're there. (laughs) You have to explain to somebody, this is what I do. This is why I'm here. This is how I can bring value to what we're doing. I mean, imagine having to go in and explain, like, you know, an engineer doesn't have to do that, right? So, and so when you have to do that over and over and over again, maybe it shoots a little bit of your confidence if you can go do something. Or maybe it gives you that extra boost of confidence, like, I'm done doing this. Like, I'm going to go work at a place where I don't have to do this anymore. I would say one trend I'm seeing, which is really cool you know, you see the world of agencies kind of ebb and flow. There's, you know, the age of the big agencies and the age of small agencies and the agencies that that swallowed up by, you know, other companies. Some of it's economic times, other, you know, there are other drivers. But lately, like we love to refer our founders to agencies when we can't do the hands-on work. And it used to be, I feel like five, six years ago when I started at GV, it was a list of pretty large agencies. Now we've built relationships. There's all these like two and three people agencies that are pretty specialized. See a lot of designers start small agencies and man, they're cool. It's like they found somebody they really enjoy working with inside of a larger design organization and they jump out and then they kind of bring their talents to others. And that's been really fun to see designers as founders in in that respect. Kate, I'm curious why more venture capitalists haven't adopted the GV model, especially as high profile as, you know, the GV design team has been for a number of years. The publications, like everyone has the sprint book. Everyone uses these methodologies that have come from GV. And certainly, as you said, like everybody you work with is very well known and very skilled at what they do, which gives all these companies that you're funding and supporting this unfair advantage, which is the phrase that's often used in the VC world. There's kind of dabbling of like, hey, we brought in a few creative people and they're making prints or they're giving a talk or something to that effect. But it's not the same sort of systematic, really focused business thinking approach that your team is doing at GV. Why isn't that happening at all the other big ones? I will say there's something that's very unique about GV. So Michael on our team, I call him kind of our archivist of GV. He, I feel like he's had every important email that's ever gone out or whatever. When I took this new role on the operating team to kind of lead the operating teams, I asked him, I said, let's go back in the history. Let's look at the history of the operating teams. 
And he found the original letter or the email kind of announcing GV and the operating teams were in there. It was listed as our secret sauce. So we were in there from the very beginning thought of as a differentiator. I can see where other firms like to bolt it on. It just may not make sense. I mean, at the end of the day, yes, the investors, as they should, they run GV and they source a lot of, you know, they source their deals. They're on the boards. They're doing all these really important things. And I could see where another investment firm could say, how could a designer really help me? Like these companies just need the money. They need the right board direction and they can hire an agency at any time. I think some founders have had experience with operating teams where it's just very transactional. You message the talent partner, they send you their list of 20 people in the market and they say, here, have at it, call, you know, like what you can do. Or they say, hey, what are your discounts? Drop me in your giant Slack channel. And that stuff, it's kind of a dime a dozen to me. The way we see it at GV, when I introduce our team to a founder, I don't have a giant Slack channel put you in. I don't have a five-page list of discounts, and I don't have a three-page list of agencies. But I guarantee anytime we engage with you, it will be a hands-on, bespoke engagement for you. If I introduce you to an agency, it's because I probably talked to them last week and I know they're perfect for your gig. If you meet with the guy who leads talent on my team... He knows your area. He knows the right people to speak with. And he's going to spend time with you, not just feeding you people, but like really understanding what's the position of the role in your organization. How's your company growing? Like we're just much more bespoke and much more hands-on and much more senior. We lean into the notion we're not going to help everybody in the fund. We certainly can't scale that, but we will work on really high impact problems. And again, it was baked in from the very beginning. When the folks at Google started GV, they were like, okay, you know, there there are funds everywhere. How is GV going to be different? And we were different in a few things. One, we were not a strategic investor. We were independent, which meant we weren't going around and hunting for startups to be bought by Google. Like there is a wall between Google and GV on what we invest in. And two, there was just discussion of this operating help and how important that would be. Let's actually shift for a little bit because I think you know, we've talked about leadership and things that you might look towards as you're a little more advanced in your career, but there's a fair number of folks in our audience who are younger and maybe just entering one of their first roles. We even have folks listening in high school, which is kind of cool. And for those folks who are maybe in their first role or two, could you talk a little bit about the pros and cons of working in a large organization like those that you've worked at versus a startup like the ones you're working with now as a designer? Sure. I do have one piece of pretty blanket advice. I don't advise somebody right out of school. I don't think your first gig should be the one designer at a startup. (laughs) There are exceptions, right? I think, you know, my alma mater is SCAD. I got a terrific education there. I've been working with them on how they approach critique and their curriculum. No matter how well your school prepares you, (laughs) like your first job, it's very different. You are working at a different pace and different iterations of things and different challenges. And you've got real world business challenges. And I think it's so important to go work with a team or work for someone who's been there before, who really wants to help you learn and lift you up. I can't imagine being my first job out of school and not having other designers like critique my work with or to discuss a brief with, or not to work for a design executive who's been doing it for a number of years, who who knows where to push and pull me and, and how to help me. So I would always say to start with at least a smaller team, if not a larger organization. I think that there's real value in joining some of these larger companies. They've got design systems work. They've got good role models for what product managers look like. They've got great front-end engineering teams. It's really a place to go in and kind of see what great looks like and kind of get your second phase of your education. And then only then can you jump out. I could have never gone to be the first head of design at LinkedIn had I not had this amazing experience at eBay, really figuring out, okay, that's what a great PM looks like. This is how you ask business questions. That's what a great manager looks like. Oh, that's a content strategist. You just don't know that stuff until you go in. So certainly there are pros and cons. A smaller company or smaller team 
you know, a lot of times you are the first person working on a problem and that can be really interesting or you get more autonomy. You can try more hats on versus a larger organization. You know, you get more structure around you, but your role may be limited. But going back to taking my own career advice, just be really explicit, whether it's once every you know year or so, what is it that I'm looking for this year? And am I working around people, working on a mission, working in a place that really fulfills that? I do tell folks, you know, it kind of holds across the board, but especially if you're joining a startup, you've got to be passionate about the work, about the mission, about the problem you're solving. And you really want to work with great people. When it's a tiny team, man, you've got to really believe in the folks that you're working with. You have to be inspired by them. You all have to feel that you lift each other up as a group. When you're a larger company, you know, you can come across pockets of people. Oh, I might not work with them again. It's okay. But a smaller company, you need to be with the right people. The other thing I have coached folks, if they go to a really small team, is if you don't have a lot of support internally, make sure that you've got folks externally that can help you. Other designers who can get together with you, bounce ideas off you, maybe a former manager to chat with you about how you're growing your career. Small companies are really fun. They move fast. You get a lot of hands-on work. But if you're truly trying to grow as a designer, I think there are benefits of being with a larger team for a bit. What sort of advice have you given students that you've worked with at SCAD and and presumably some of the candidates you've interviewed over the years regarding presenting their work and how they tell their story of, you've thought a lot about it personally, how do you present to others like, I want to get this job, I have to tell the right story, present my work very effectively. What's the guidance you often offer? I think it goes back to exactly what you just said, tell a story. As designers, I think sometimes we want to just put the work on screen and say, it with, you know, yeah. the work speaks for itself. I made this, I made that, I made this. Yeah, exactly. But there's a couple that I want to know what problem were you trying to solve and what role did you have in solving it, right? So again, great work doesn't happen in a vacuum. I'd much rather somebody get up and say, I was one of three designers and, you know, this is what I did than pretend to take credit for everything, And then I think also be really honest, you know, when you are sharing your work, this is what I thought could have gone better. This is what I would do differently had I gone to go back and and had to change things like be reflective before a designer gets into an interview. They've probably made some type of pass where the hiring manager looked at 50, 60 online portfolios, right? Like you only have one chance to make an impression when something's digital, tell the story, show a variety of work. For God's sake, don't have typos. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, honestly, it, it, it infuriates me. Make sure the container with which you know your portfolio is in—that's your place to show design. Try to tailor it a bit to the place that you're trying to get the role with. On the flip side, I mean, that's why I would say to, to newer designers. But on the flip side, what I always tell a hiring manager, and again, it could be three people hiring a designer, it could be a designer that's going to come in and join a big team. I always tell them to have, always have a designer present their portfolio. Always. Number one thing. First thing of the day before they get into interviews, a designer should present their portfolio. And I, I tell them to give them very loose requirements. Tell the designer they've got 45 minutes. We want to see the work. We also want to hear the stories on how the work was done. Leave time for Q&A. And you can tell a lot by a designer on how they present their work. Is it always I, I, I? Do they leave big chunks of their career out? (laughs) What happened there? We have to be realistic. Like sometimes I've put stuff up there that I'm like, I'm not as proud of it, but it tells a good story. It shows I've got experience. If you stop a designer midway through and say, no, really tell me what was your role? How did you work with the PM? What would you have done differently? That's where you really start to learn about somebody. How do they talk about their work, their team? What drives them? How do they tell their story? Do they run over by 15 minutes? You know, you know as a designer, your work is very important, but an astute hiring manager is paying attention to all the stuff around the design as well. What are you listening, reading, or watching that is interesting and exciting to you? 
One of my favorite podcasts right now is this one called Acquired. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where they tell the stories of how businesses were started. And the most recent one, it's funny, I'm telling everybody to listen to the Costco episode <laughs> because I'm just endlessly fascinated with like how businesses were started and, and Costco. I, I actually recently I listened to the Costco one, Porsche and Nike and lo- even Lockheed Martin, hearing just about how founders had these early ideas and how they were principled and how they built out their companies and grew their brands. That's one I just find really inspiring right now. And then uh, I just read, I had a lot of beach reads over the summer. So, <laughs> Yeah. So tell us, where can people learn more about you and the work that you're doing? You know, my work is always up to date on LinkedIn, or you can also go to gv.com and you can check out some of the startups that we're working with as well. Well, Kate, thank you so much for chatting with us. I, you know, I have to say before we wrap up here, I'm just impressed with, despite this amazing career that you've had, you remain very grounded and just very clear-headed about what you're doing and the openness and the connection you have with SCAD and the design community. It's just tremendously valuable to so many people. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. It's been really fun to chat with you. Have you seen the new MacBook Air? Oh man, they are so fast, they're super light, and they are beautiful. And we're giving one away to a lucky winner. To enter to win the new MacBook Air, all you have to do is complete our listener survey. Tell us a bit about you and share your feedback about the show. It'll help us improve, and you could soon be enjoying a brand new MacBook Air. To take the survey, visit dbtr.co slash 2024 survey. That's dbtr.co slash 2024 survey, and you'll automatically be entered to win. We'll randomly select a winner on Friday, March 1st, so be sure to complete the survey by then. This episode was produced by Eli Woolery and me, Aaron Walter, with engineering and production support from Brian Paik of Pacific Audio. If you found this episode useful, we hope that you'll leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to finer shows. Or simply drop a link to the show in your team's Slack channel, designbetterpodcast.com. It'll really help others discover the show. Until next time.